Good morning. Um, last time we introduced the uh, repeated measures design, uh, we said that this is an experimental design. The same subject is measured twice, right? And we're looking for significant difference between the pretest and the post-test. So we have our before measurement, we have the treatment, we have the after measurement, and then we have a difference. We're essentially looking at where this D bar, right, this mean difference, falls on this new sampling distribution of differences between means. So if you guys remember, we have a normally distributed infinite amount of mean differences with the mean of the mean differences being exactly what it is. You know, the mean of the mean differences in the population. We did a couple of examples of this correlated t-test, which is also called the paired t-test, right? It's also called the dependent sample t-test. Uh, I left you with uh, another example. A researcher is interested in knowing the effect which one ounce of 100 proof alcohol has on his subjects. To study this effect, the researcher randomly selects 10 subjects, n is 10, and records their reaction times in seconds, that's the dependent variable, both before and after drinking one ounce of 100 proof alcohol. Can the researcher conclude at alpha 01 that the average reaction time is longer after consuming one ounce of 100 proof alcohol? So we see a difference here, you know. We actually see about a 0.11 second difference. And as, you know, if we inspect the data, we see that about 8 out of 10 individuals are actually, you know, a bit slower after the introduction of this, you know, treatment uh, to, you know, remain the same. Now our question becomes, you know, are they significant, you know, is the, are the post-test scores significantly slower? And we, and we know, of course, it all depends on where this individual D-bar falls on the sampling distribution. If this D bar of negative 0.11 falls out in one of the tails beyond the critical values, we can say that the distance from the mid-region is far enough to be deemed significantly different, and our decision will be to reject the null. If this D bar, which is going to correspond to some T statistic, falls in the middle, we'll say that that distance isn't far enough from the mid-region, and we would decide to accept the null. We have a null hypothesis again, which states that there's no difference in the population between the mean of the pre and the post test. And if we notice, we have unknown mu's. Their mu's, mu is unknown, which is fine. The alternative hypothesis is the opposite. There is a difference in the population. And we know that in this case, no effect, there is an effect. We set alpha at 0.01 which is a bit stricter. Degrees of freedom is n minus 1, which is 9. We know that before we run any statistical test, p and alpha are the same. We can find a critical value. Because we're running a two-tailed test, we have to divide our alpha by 2 to get the area in the one tail, which is 0.005 half a percent. We go across the top to 005, down the side to 9, and we have a number. And that number is 3.25. Our critical value is positive and negative 3.25. If T exceeds this, we have enough evidence to reject the null and say that the alcohol had a significant effect on the post-test scores. We can compute T. The t-statistic is the mean difference, that's the numerator, negative 0.11, divided by the standard error of the difference, this denominator. If we look at this, this requires us to compute a standard deviation of this difference column of scores. So we treat this difference column of scores just like we would treat any generic univariate x data set, we treat this as x, 
we're going to have to compute a standard deviation of the different scores, which we know is the square root of the variance. We have to square each x data point. Negative 0.1 squared, 0 0.01, 0, uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.04, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0.01. Square each x data point, bring everything down to sum. Um, we'll do a sum x, a sum x quantity squared, a sum x squared, and we know n is 10. In this case, sum x is negative 1.1. That number squared is 1.21. The sum of the squared x's in this case is 0.17 with an n of 10. Now you had to be rather meticulous in this computation because of all the decimals. It just can, can be confusing to some students. So, you, you know. And again, your keystrokes are really important on your calculators. Once we have this information, we can compute the standard deviation of the difference column of scores by just filling in <coughs> sum x squared 0.17 minus the sum x quantity squared, uh, 1.21 over the n of 10, all over the n of 10. Simple order of operations. Standard deviation of the difference column of scores. Bring the rad down always, 0.17 minus this whole quantity. 1.21 divided by 10 is 0.121. over 10. This minus this is 0 0.049 over 10. This becomes the square root of 0 0.0049 the standard deviation of our difference column of scores in this case is 0 0.07 which is a fairly small number and we see we don't have a whole lot of dispersion here obtaining this now enables us to uh, compute our denominator of our t-statistic the standard error of the difference s subscript d bar is the S sub D 0 0.07 divided by the square root of our sample size 0 0.07 square root of 10 is 3.16 standard error of the difference in this case 0 0.022 So we know that one T unit in this case is 0 0.022 seconds. 0 0.022 seconds. We insert this number where it belongs, 0 0.022. T ends up being negative 5. Negative 5. We have a decision to make, don't we? Yep. We use the rule. This should be second nature to you now. We're past the midterm of the semester. We're like, you know, kind of almost two-thirds of the way through maybe. We compare the calculated statistic to the critical value. We see it exceeds it in the negative direction. Therefore, our decision is to reject the null. Yeah. We have a pretty rare event here in this t-statistic of negative 5. So this d-bar of negative 0.11, it's actually way out here. Pretty doggone rare event. We've made that determination based on, based on the, you know, this information. Our decision is to reject the null. So what happened to the P region? 
smaller. It got smaller. If p is less than alpha, we reject the null. But why, why did the p region get smaller? Well, let's look. The critical values were negative and positive 3.25. So the critical values were right here and here before we ran the t-test. But after we ran the t-test, t turned into negative 5. This region remained at 0.005, or a half a percent. But this region got reduced. This needle went from here over to negative 5 and made this area of p smaller, therefore affecting the total area of p of making it smaller than 1% of the total area under the sampling distribution of differences between means. This now enables us to answer our question. That's the whole point of this. So, can the researcher conclude at alpha-01 that the average reaction time is longer after consuming one ounce of 100 proof alcohol? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now again, there is a small chance that my decision to reject the null was not a correct one, so I rejected this null with about 99% certainty, about 99% confidence. There is a small chance that my decision is not a correct one. You know, and the likelihood I committed a type 2 error in this case is, is irrelevant. It's, it's a non-issue. So we see another example of this uh, repeated measures design, you know, measuring the first time and then administering a treatment, measuring after the treatment and looking for some difference. You know, and as we see, you know, 8 out of 10 people uh, were slower after the treatment. We've determined that we do have a significant effect that is real and most likely exists in the population. We can now generalize our results from sample to population because we used randomization. Now if you notice on your sheets, on uh, number 7 and 8, I want you to address alpha. So 7, what is the type 1 error rate? And what does it mean? The type 1 error rate. This means that if we were to replicate this a hundred more times, we would correctly reject the null 99 times, incorrectly reject the null one time. Let me repeat that. What is the type 1 error rate and what does it mean? This is what it means. If we were to replicate, based on the information here, based on, on these results, if we were to replicate this experiment 100 more times, we would correctly reject the null 99 times, incorrectly reject it one time. And what's the probability that the observed differences were due to chance? Really, really small, like perhaps 1%. The likelihood that uh, the observed differences are real and exist in the population is rather large, like 99%. The correlated t-test, also called the paired t-test, also called the dependent sample t-test. Okay, um, let's move to hypothesis test number four. Hypothesis test number four is a situation where we have two independent groups. Two independent groups. In hypothesis test number three, if you remember, we had one group measured twice. Yes? No, I, you'll have a formula sheet. Okay. Yeah, just like you always do. Yep. In number four, 
we have two independent groups. In number three, we had one group measured twice, pre and post. In this case, we have two independent groups, you know, group one and group two. You know, group one might be a control group, group two could be the experimental group, you know. Group one might be freshmen, group two is seniors. You know, group one might be female, group two male, group one dogs, group two cats. Two independent groups. And guess what? We have scores on a dependent variable and we have means. The mean of the first group and the mean of the second group. And we look at these means and we say, hmm, there's a difference here. Gee, I wonder if this difference is real and, you know, exists in the population or I wonder if it just happened by chance. We are testing a null hypothesis in this case which states that the means in the population are equal and we're going to write it as mu sub 1 equals mu sub 2. We could also write this as mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 equals 0. No difference in the population. We know the null always implies no, the statement of no. The alternative hypothesis, two-tailed, mu sub 1 is not equal to mu sub 2. Another way of writing this, mu 1 minus mu 2 is not equal to 0. There is a difference. We can set alpha equal to 05 and run a two-tailed test. We know that before we run any statistical test, P equals alpha. In this case, our degrees of freedom is the N of the first group plus the N of the second group minus 2. It's the number of subjects in the first group plus the number of subjects in the second group minus 2. We can find a critical value and so on and so forth. Same drill, different research scenario. This research question becomes, is there a significant difference between the means of two independent groups? We have a statistical hypothesis test called the two independent sample t-test. This is called a two independent sample t-test where our t-statistic is again mean difference divided by standard error of the difference. Mean difference divided by standard error of the difference. So again, we see a mean difference in the numerator, error estimate in the denominator. And this is the variance of the first group divided by the n of the first group plus the variance of the second group divided by the n of the second group. Oops. Could you pass these out please? Our sampling distribution remains the same. We are still working with a sampling distribution of differences between means but now we just sort of express some things a little bit differently. We are still working in a sampling distribution of mean differences, but now we just express these mean differences as instead of d bar, we just say x bar sub 1 minus x bar sub 2. We just express the mean differences as the mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group. We're still working, bless you, with a sampling distribution of differences between means, but we just express these infinite amount of data points 
a little bit differently. Instead of d bar, we just symbolize as x bar sub 1 minus x bar sub 2. The mid region, we're going to call mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2. Mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2. Mean difference divided by standard error of the difference. There is a sheet being passed out. Let's do it real quickly. Examples. <clears throat> Let's um, Look at example one. We will take care of you guys in a minute. We randomly assigned 18 children We randomly assigned 18 children to two groups, two independent groups, and asked each child to feed their pet every day for one week. The children in one group were praised each time their pets were fed. And the kids in the other group were praised only at the end of the week. And the following data represents the number of times each child forgot to do his or her task. So we have a dependent variable that we're going to call forgetfulness. The number of times each child forgot to do his or her task. We have the daily reward group and the weekly reward group. These are the numbers. Uh, the mean of our first group is 2.33. We have an n of 9. And the mean of the second group is 1.44 with an n of 9. Were the group praised at the end of the day significantly more forgetful than the group praised at the end of the week? Well, we see that this number is larger than this number. I mean, on the surface, you know, it, it appear, you know, the kids that were praised at the end of the day for feeding their pet are a bit more forgetful. Yeah. This number is larger than this. But are they significantly more forgetful? And this, is, this determination is going to be based on, you know, where this individual mean difference falls on this sampling distribution of mean differences. Same drill. If it falls out in one of the tails, what's our decision going to be? Yes. Yeah. If that does not come to you immediately, there's something wrong. Okay? There's something wrong. Okay? You know, this, this is stuff that's like automatic now. If this mean difference falls in the middle somewhere, what's the decision going to be? Yes. Yeah, accept the null. We can compute the T statistic before we do that. We'll find a critical value. This thing calls for an O5 alpha and a two-tailed test. We'll write the null in the alternative. This will be provided for you on a formula sheet. Alpha is O5, therefore P is O5. Degrees of freedom, the end of the first group, 9, plus the end of the second group, 9, is 18, minus 2 is 16. We have 16 degrees of freedom, O5 alpha, we will divide alpha by 2 to get the area in the one tail because we're dealing with a one-tailed set of t-critical values. So we go across the top to 025, down the side to 16. There's a number there, and that number is 2.12, positive or negative 2.12. 
If t exceeds this, we have enough evidence to reject the null. We can now compute our t-statistic. We have a mean difference, 2.33 minus 1.44, divided by our standard error of the difference. And if we look at this denominator, we immediately see that we have to compute variances. Oh, yeah. Let's go back to week two of the course. The variance, what is that? Well, computational formula, and we actually have to do this for both data sets. We compute a variance for group one and a variance for group two. We know how to do that. Let's just uh, you know, review this real quickly. We have to do this twice. We'll start with group one. We treat this as x. We have to square each x data point. Bring everything down to sum. Sum x is equal to 21. 21 squared is 441. This sum x squared, the sum of these squared x's is 61 with an n of 9. We can compute the variance of the first group. Sum x squared, 61, minus the sum x quantity squared, 441, over our n of um, 9, all over our n of 9. Computational formula for variance. Let's bring this thing down. The variance of the first group, 61 minus this whole quantity here. 441 divided by 9 is 49, all over 9. Variance of the first group is 12 over 9. Variance of the first group is 1.33. Variance of the first group, 1.33, and that would be over our n of 9, plus the variance of the second group. So we have to do this again on the weekly data. And we treat this as any you know, generic univariate data set. We have to square each of these x data points. We square each one of these x data points. Do the summation thing again. We have an n of 9. In this case, sum x is 13. Uh, 13 squared is um, 169. Uh, the sum x squared, the sum of the squared x's in this case is 29. Uh, with an n of 9. We can now compute the variance of the second group. Let's just do that real quickly here. We have our formula, sum x squared, 29, minus the sum x quantity squared, 169, over our n of 9, all over our n of 9. Simple computational formula for variance. We're just reviewing here from section 1. Variance of the second group, 29 minus this whole quantity, which is 18.78 over 9. This becomes 10.22 uh, over 9. Variance of our second group, 1.13. Variance of our second group, 1.13, and we put that where it belongs. Variance of the second group, 1.13, over the n of 9. We can compute t. t 
ends up being 1.68. We have a decision to make. As per always, we compare our calculated statistic to the critical value. We see it doesn't exceed it. Therefore, our decision based on this particular null hypothesis is to do what? Accept, Accept the null. We are having our exam three the day we get back from spring break, that Tuesday. That's just the way it works out. I'll talk about that. I'm going to do a little review next class session for, you know, for that. But uh, anyway, we accepted the null. What happened to our P region class? It got larger as the result of that needle shift. If P is greater than alpha, we accept the null. And we know that the needle started out at the critical values positive negative 2.12, T turned into positive 1.68, this needle stayed right here, this area remained at 2.5%, but this needle shifted from here back to 1.68, may actually made this area of P larger, right? Its total effect on P was to make it larger than alpha. <coughs> Let's answer the question now. We have enough statistical evidence to help us answer this question. Class, were the group praised at the end of the day significantly more forgetful than the group praised at the end of the week? No, no apparently not. Apparently what we're observing here probably just happened by chance. And what's most likely going on is that there's no difference in the population on forgetfulness, you know, between the group that is praised at the end of the day, you know, versus the group that's praised at the end of the week for feeding their pet. So we have a non-significant statistic. We're, we're basically saying that the groups are equal on forgetfulness. The groups are equal on forgetfulness. And we know that the status of alpha at this point is just kind of irrelevant. It's kind of a non-issue. And we also know that there's a small chance that we may have made a type 2 error. There's a small chance, and I'm talking small chance, that we may have accepted the null when we really should have rejected the null. Is, is it a 5% chance or is it smaller than that? Uh, it's, it's, don't worry about that. Okay. Yeah, you, if you notice I haven't attached a number to it, it's a little bit complicated. Um, just know it's a, just a small likelihood. It has something to do with power. Power is 1 minus beta, so power comes into it and such. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Um, in your textbooks, there's an example. It's not an exercise, Mark. It's an example. Example 10-9. Just in your free study time, uh, go to that example. This is basically what we're doing in these examples here. And all we're doing is looking for significant differences between the means of two independent groups. Okay, let's do another one. For six months, we worked with two groups of 15 severely developmentally handicapped individuals in an attempt to train them in self-care skills through imitation and physical guidance. So we have two independent groups, the group that receives imitation training, the group that receives physical guidance training. For both groups, we have ratings on the levels of required assistance for each person. So the DV in this case is required assistance. High equals much assistance. 
Did the group receiving imitation treatment require significantly more assistance than the group receiving physical guidance? Let me just get the numbers in here. Uh, the mean of the first group is 9.8 with an N of 15. Uh, required assistance numbers for the second group. Mean of the second group, in this case, is 6.9 with an N of 15. Typically, I would have you compute variances. In this case, I'm going to give them to you just to save time. The variance of the first group is 32. The variance of the second group is 25.7. So let's just pretend that we took the time to compute those. This is what we would have gotten. And I'm assuming that you can compute simple variances at this point. Let's look at the research question again. Did the group receiving the imitation treatment require significantly more assistance than the group receiving physical guidance? Well, on the surface, we see that this imitation group, you know, the imitation group, yeah, they require more assistance. This number is larger than this number. See? Our question, though, is do they require significantly more assistance? And this will be determined by, you know, where does this individual mean difference fall on the sampling distribution of mean differences? Same drill. We have a null hypothesis which states that you know, the means are equal in the population. There's no difference in the population. An alternative hypothesis that states that there is a difference in the population. We're um, using an O1 alpha in this case, and we're running a two-tailed test. We always run two-tailed tests. We know that before we run any statistical test, our P equals alpha. Degrees of freedom, 15 plus 15 is 30, minus 2 is 28. 28 degrees of freedom. We can find a critical value. We know that we have to divide alpha by 2 to get the area in the one tail because our t tables in our textbooks are only one tailed uh, t critical values. So if we divide O1 by 2, we get 0 0.005. That's a half of 1% in each tail, right? We go across the top to 0 005, down the side to 28 DF. And there's a number there. That number is 2.763. So you see at alpha 01, critical values are a bit higher. If T exceeds this in either direction, we have enough evidence to reject the null. We can now compute T, and we just fill in mean difference, 9.8 minus 6.9 over standard error of the difference. The variance of the first group, 32, over the N of the first group, 15 plus the variance of the second group, um, 25.7 over the N for the second group, 15. And as it turns out, our T statistic is equal to 1.48. 1.48. It's decision time.
using the rule. We compare the calculated statistic to the critical value. We see it doesn't exceed it. Therefore, it's obvious that our decision would be to accept the null. Let's answer the question. Did the group receiving the imitation treatment require significantly more assistance than the group receiving physical guidance? No. Apparently not. We know that the P region got larger as a result of that needle shift. If P is greater than alpha, we accept the null. We know that alpha is a non-entity. It's a non-issue at this point. Small chance I may have made a type 2 error. It is at this point that I would like to readdress and get back to our discussion that we had on February 27th on statistical power. Now if we remember, we said that power is symbolized as 1 minus beta. We said that power, and it's all in your notes there on February 27th, power is the likelihood of correctly rejecting a false null. We also refer to this as the likelihood of finding significance. The likelihood of finding significance. And we said, if you remember, that power is a function of four things. And it should be right in front of you there. Power is a function of four things. Power is a function of mean difference, right? We said what? As mean difference increases, power increases. Let's just take a look at that again. It's right in the formula. As mean difference increases, power increases. This is a mean difference. So what happens to this numerator when we have really, really, really large mean differences? Right, it makes the, mean, the, the numerator really large. So if we have really, really large numerator, what's its effect going to be on t? t is going to be really, really large. And if we have really, really large t statistics, aren't we going to reject a lot of nulls? Yeah. Now, yeah, it's a function of the other things as well, but, you know, if, you know, if we have large mean difference, we have high likelihood of finding significance. We said the second element of power is sample size. We said as n increases, power increases, right? Let's look at the formula. This is simple math. What happens to these ratios? When these ends get really, 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 really large, what happens to the ratios? They get really, really small, right. So if we have really, really, really small denominator, what's its effect going to be on t? It's going to make t really, really large. If we have really, really large t statistics, aren't we going to reject a lot of nulls? Yeah. As sample size increases, power increases. Now this is where it gets good. Remember I talked about focus? This is where you have to focus, okay? Our third element of power, we called what? Within group variability. Within group variability. What is that? 
Simple, it's the variability within groups. This variance is the variability within this group. This variance is the variability within this group. We abbreviated within group variability WGV and we said as WGV decreases, power increases. What do we mean by that? This is really important and you really need to get this, okay? We have a non-significant statistic here, don't we? There's a reason for it. You know what the reason is? Power. We didn't have enough power. But let's take a look at that closer. What really happened? Well, gee, T was non-significant. I wonder why. Probably because this denominator was too big. Why was the denominator too big? Too much within group variation. These variances were too large. But let's take a look at that even closer. <coughs> Class, what ends up happening, if you look at these two data sets, these two data sets are way, way more similar than they are different. And, and we made that determination in accepting the null. We basically concluded that you know, there's no difference. They're equal. But, but look at these. I mean, look, look at the data. Look. These two data sets are very similar. Look at the numbers. Look, there's a zero here and a zero here, a 14 here, 14 here, 8 here, 8 here. There's a 4 here, a 4 here. These data sets are very, very similar, but you know what? They have different means. They have different means. But the culprit here, in, you know, in, in terms of not being able to reject the null, was that our denominator was too big because we had too much within group variability. Let's create a little simulation. Let's create some data. Let's pretend that, yeah, we have 15 subjects and we have a mean of 9.8. But let's say instead of this particular data array, ranging from 0 to 19, that our data look something like this, with a mean of 9.8. The data looks like this, 10, 10, 10, 10, 9, 10, 10, 10, 10, 9, 9, 10, 10, 10. To produce a mean a little bit less than 10, right? this mean would be a little bit less than 10, like 9.8. Class, if we were to compute a variance on this set of scores, it's got the identical mean, right, 9.8. But if we were to compute a variance on this set of scores, what would it be? Really, really small, wouldn't it? There's, there's little or no variation here, right? Let's try this again. Let's go over to this data set. It has a mean of 6.9. It ranges from 0 to 14, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's pretend instead that this data set you know, has a mean of 6.9, but looks something like this. 7, 7, 7, 7, 6, 6, 7, 7, 7, 6, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7. To produce a mean a little bit less than 7. If we were to compute a mean on this, it would be a little bit less than 7 like 6.9. Look, we got the same means. If we were to compute a variance on this set of scores, what would it be? Really, really teeny. Look, we got the same means. Now, visually, isn't it obvious that these two sets of numbers are different from each other than these two sets of numbers? Absolutely, with the same means. If we were to compute variances on these two sets of scores and run a t-test on these two sets of scores, t would be enormous with the same means. See what I'm saying? 
In this little simulation exercise, we've simply reduced the level of within group variation, keeping the means constant to sort of illustrate my point here, that as within group variability decreases, as you know, what happened in this little simulation, power increases. In other words, if we were to run the t-test on this set of data, our variances would have been really, really, really small. And what would have happened to t? Would have made really, really large. Would we have rejected the null? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes? So basically, if all the numbers like in that one group are very close to each other, you're most likely going to be rejecting that null every time? And all we're talking about is, you know, when that in close to each other, not a whole lot of within group variation. Here, the culprit was we had too much variation within groups. So much variation within groups that it actually made these two groups way, way too similar. In fact, these groups are now so similar that we didn't have enough evidence to, re we actually accepted the statement that says that they're actually equal. These two groups are actually equal, despite the fact that we have this mean difference. Basically, all we're saying is that this mean difference probably just happened by chance. And finally, as you guys know, the fourth element of power is alpha. Just good old alpha. As alpha increases, as alpha increases, what happens to power? It increases. And we know simply, you know, <clears throat> common alpha levels. We know that alpha of O5 is the most common. <coughs> and it's actually easier to reject the null here than it is to reject here. As alpha increases, man, these numbers are getting bigger, aren't they? As alpha increases, the likelihood of finding significance increases. So class, for every z-test that we ran weeks ago, for every z-test and every one sample t and every correlated t, right, and every two independent sample t, power is always an issue. Power is, so if we reject the null, do you know why we rejected the null? Because we had enough power. Power is a function of these four things. These four things working together, right, to produce a statistic that's either significant or non-significant. If we accept the null, what's the reason? We didn't have enough power. Simple as that. If we reject the null, we had enough power. Yay. If we accept the null, we didn't have enough power. It's as simple as that. So again, power is the reason. Power is the reason why we either reject or fail to reject. And it's just a function of mean difference, sample size, within group variability, and the alpha we set. So this alpha of O1 is less powerful than O5. These critical values are higher. It takes a higher test statistic to reject at O1 than it does at O5. OK. Um, this next problem I would like you to do for homework. Answer these questions at the bottom. The T result. The actual t result is negative 2.82. I'm just giving this to you ahead of time. I would like you to do this uh, problem for homework. Uh, Thursday, we're going to um, come back. We're going to finish this section. I'm going to have a few more comments on this section. And um, then I'm going, to have a th I'm going to do a thorough review of this last section in prep for our exam. Uh, the following Tuesday. That is all for today. I will see you guys on Thursday.